It is my profound privilege and pleasure to welcome you all to this momentous and long-awaited occasion of the launch of our Infrastructure 2030 Strategic Plan. I say our, as it does not belong only to the Department of Infrastructure, Ports and Transport, but to all our partners locally, regionally, and internationally. Infrastructure 2030 was a brainchild of Senior Minister Honorable Stevenson King, who had a vision to develop a holistic plan for all our infrastructural needs, thereby addressing the perennial deficiencies that keep surfacing year after year. In addition to coping with the developmental needs of our small island, still developing state, we must also grapple with the ravages of increasingly devastating weather events. Mr. Philip Dalsu provided invaluable consultancy support in developing the plan, ensuring that all staff were sufficiently engaged and knowledgeable on the respective components of the strategic plan. Infrastructure 2030 strategic plan is an organic document which defined, redefines how we think of infrastructure, from purely physical to include technological and organizational components of interrelated systems which provide commodities and services necessary for economic and societal transformations. To us, Infrastructure 2030 is not just a written report to be placed on a shelf. We have actively embraced its prescriptions and proceeded with implementation at all levels of the department. Our Energy and Public Utilities Division recently launched our updated national energy policy, which continues to attract regional and international interest, which supports the government's thrust towards creation of a suite of renewable energy alternatives. Our Electricity Supply Act has been under rigorous review to ensure at least 50% penetration of renewable energy in the electricity mix by 2030. Public sensitization on this bill will commence shortly towards promulgation. The new electronic communications bill is also at the end stages of review, addressing a number of matters, including network resiliency for critical infrastructure of service providers. A recent peer review of our metrological services has identified a number of shortcomings which must be addressed in order to meet international standards for these services. Decisive steps have already been taken to address these shortcomings through formulation of a draft strategic plan, and for the first time in its history, preparation of a draft meteorological services bill. Another first in the Department of Infrastructure, Ports and Transport is a preparation of an integrated and sustainable road-based public transport plan funded by the Caribbean Development Bank. The final document has already been widely circulated and is available for perusal. Our materials laboratory has been moving at a steady pace towards accreditation. Significant investments have been made to enhance the capacity of both equipment and staff to meet the demands of our strategic agenda. Some of this equipment is available on display today. The electrical division has installed in excess of 18,000 21 watt LED lights and over 6,075 watt bulbs island-wide, resulting in hundreds of thousands of dollars in savings. Another first is the low-tension electricity network between Belvedere Canaries to Katshime Buto to accommodate the installation of streetlights. Our maritime sector is swelling with growth potential. The department continues to forge stronger ties with other agencies such as Invest St. Lucia and the St. Lucia Air and Seaports Authority towards the establishment of a chamber of shipping, an open ship registry, and other entities which will ensure consistent implementation of our maritime responsibilities. These nuggets that I have just shared with you are meant to stimulate your interest and in and excitement for the journey we have embarked upon. Each and every one of you, our especially invited guests, will play a vital role in partnering with us towards successful implementation whether it is through technical assistance or support. Every sector, health, education, agriculture, tourism, national security, etc., will be impacted by this strategic plan. The cornerstones of implementation are the dynamic, hardworking staff of the Department of Infrastructure 
who have so passionately embraced the concept and tenets of this vision. I know the sacrifices you make being exposed daily to harsh weather conditions, even now. After the passage of severe weather, when everyone else is running in, you are running out to ensure the integrity of our infrastructure is maintained and normalcy is restored in the quickest possible time. Today, I tell you publicly that your commitment, steadfastness, and responsiveness to the call of duty are deeply appreciated. The only question left, therefore, is for you, esteemed colleagues and friends, are you in for structure? Thank you. First of all, let me thank you for adjusting and amending the program to allow me to, to say a few words. I am not intended to give an address, because this morning basically belongs to my colleague, the senior minister, and his staff. My job today is basically to endorse what we are doing here this morning. And when we speak of, of infrastructure, what comes to my mind is climate change and what I saw in St. Vincent and Grenada last week. And if there's one thing that keeps me awake or makes me wake up in the night with, an, with a nightmare is St. Lucia getting hit by category three, four, or five hurricane. It is something that consumes me because I saw firsthand the level of human suffering and the level of infrastructural damage that happened in these two islands. And I say to myself, whether we have the resilience and whether St. Lucia can, can survive if something of this nature hits us. But I believe in our people and I think we will survive. This is why the strategic plan for infrastructure leading up to the year 2030 is that important. But building that plan must be resilience. Building that plan must be adaptation and mitigation for what will happen, what is inevitable. And I've said before, we in these islands, we suffer the most from the effects of climate change. But we are not the ones who've caused, who've caused climate change, but we suffer the most. But this is how the world, the world is, the powerful are always right. So in building our plans, in dealing with our infrastructure going forward, we have to ensure that built in there is resilience for climate change. And I recall some time ago, I used to sit in that office there. I was Minister of Infrastructure, and my office was the nicest office in the whole government, and he still is. We, and we, we were building the Badawansh Bridge. And in that bridge, we decided that there would have to be resilience if there was a hurricane or if there was a storm. A storm, oh, I think they said it was one in a thousand year storm. And at that point, at that point, we, we were not even aware of really the effects of climate change. And we decided that that bridge would have cost a little more than a normal and a regular bridge. And instead of that concept being appreciated, we were vilified. We were vilified at the time because we had the vision that we had to build not for today, but we had to build for the future and we had to build resilience, inbuilt resilience. So we spent a few more dollars we spent on that bridge. And as is usual in our country, there was a whole hue and cry and all kinds of accusations, all kinds of audits, all kinds of verification, all kinds of things, just because we built resilience into the infrastructure in this country. And I'm pleased to tell you that this bridge was built below cost, and hopefully it will have the resilience to be able 
to absorb a cat free or cat for hurricane. And I'm very proud of that achievement. And I want to thank the staff of the ministry who, who, had, who stood by us during that time. <laughs> Infrastructure, we like to think, is about roads, roads and roads and roads and roads. That's an important part of infrastructure. During my budget address, we spoke of the year of infrastructure. And this aligns perfectly with what the Ministry of Infrastructure is doing. Infrastructure deals with digital infrastructure, as I said, housing infrastructure, health infrastructure, educational infrastructure, economic infrastructure, agricultural infrastructure, social infrastructure, and water and wastewater infrastructure. Also, renewable energy. And I'm happy to hear that the Electricity Supply Act should become part of the laws of solution very shortly. I've constantly said to the minister, the senior minister, that we have to ensure that the Electricity Supply Act becomes part of the law of this country. Because when you speak to investors, they say to you, the cost of electricity in this country, we have to modify it. We have to understand, and that doesn't mean that the electricity supplier has not done or is not doing a wonderful job. And Lucille has been one of the best run utility companies in the region. But we have to amend and we have to adjust for the times. And I'm sure that Lucille will have the flexibility to continue their service, but, but to adjust for the times so we can use the renewable energy and what we have available to us. So I really want to endorse this plan. I want to thank the, the minister. I want to thank the staff. I want to, uh, I want you to, I want to thank you for allowing me to leave at a, a particular time. I really must go. And I'm only here, and I came here because I want to fully align myself with what's happening and to thank the minister and the permanent secretary and the staff of the infrastructure ministry, a ministry that I held at some point, and to tell them there are also roads in Castries East. <laughs> Have a good day. Infrastructure, people of my land. So, are you infrastructure? We putting it together. Are you infrastructure? We planning for the future. Are you infrastructure? Binding us in place. Are you infrastructure? Utilizing every space. 
Unplanned development, inefficient waste management, only lit streets, pathways incomplete. That is the object of infrastructure 2030 project. Alright, give me. We working for you. We planning for you. Just for you. It's all about you. We working for you. We planning for you. At infrastructure, though you may not see. There's a team working hard for you and me Preparing to meet the challenges And effects of climate change with mindful ease From modern family homes at Mass Square To rehabilitating roadways Networks spread like arteries across the land World class infrastructure Built by Lucian hands. So are you infrastructure? We putting it together. Are you infrastructure? We planning for the future. Are you infrastructure? Binding us in place. Are you infrastructure? Utilizing every space. Housing issues. Flooding issues. Sidewalks with holes. Streets with potholes That is the object of Infrastructure 2030 project We working for you We planning for you Just for you It's all about you We working for you We planning for you when there is structure, everything aligns Once it's well thought of, no one's left behind Schools and hospitals, modern, strong and new With our small budget, the least we could do Green parks blossoming, places to explore Eco-friendly tourists will adore Nature and progress in Total harmony Are you infrastructure? Not haphazardly So are you infrastructure? We putting it together Are you infrastructure? We planning for the future Are you infrastructure? Binding us in place Are you infrastructure? Utilizing every space Doing things anyhow Waiting on long lines now Digi.gov is it From your device could submit That is the object Of infrastructure 2030 project We working for you We planning for you Just for you It's all about you We working for you we planning for you Thank you I am delighted to make some brief remarks today on the launching of infrastructure 2030. I wish to first congratulate the Department of Infrastructure, Ports and Transport on achieving this major landmark of completing Infrastructure 2030. I know that there were two earlier attempts at completing and developing a strategic plan, both of which were unsuccessful. Uh, now, we would say the third time proved to be lucky. But I wish to assure you it was not by chance, but through diligence, discipline, and effort of the staff of the Department of Infrastructure, Ports, and Transport. It was Senior Minister King who coined the term Infrastructure 2030. This was a recognition of the long life and high cost of infrastructure. 
He understood that it was necessary to take a broad and long-term view of the country's development needs, reflecting the anticipated economic, social, environmental, and demographic changes, and to be also far-sighted enough to capitalize on technological advances. The latest, I'm sure you all are aware of, artificial intelligence, or AI, as it is known. Infrastructure is the backbone of the economy, and it is absolutely imperative that the growth, transformation, and modernization of the economy requires the government to address a substantial infrastructure deficit. Major infrastructure projects take a long time to be delivered, and given the huge investments involved, it is absolutely important that a strategic plan be developed to ensure that these investments are carefully considered and planned to ensure that they are successful. It is for this reason that Senior Minister King advocated for a strategic plan for a period that is longer than the norm for a strategic plan, which is typically three to four years. As has already been mentioned, the term infrastructure covers a range of economic, social, environmental, and digital assets, which contribute to improving the competitiveness of the economy, improving the lives of people, and importantly, ensuring the sustainability of the future development of the country and future generations. The department has deliberately confined its strategic plan to the portfolios that fall under its purview, while recognizing that it would have to collaborate with other agencies in implementing their respective infrastructure plans. Infrastructure 2030 therefore provides the direction that the Department of Infrastructure, Ports and Transport will take over the next six years to achieve its strategic priorities that align with its vision and mission. As part of the strategic planning process, it was important to imagine what the Department of Infrastructure, Ports and Transport should look like in 2030 and the type of infrastructure that would be required to support the growth and development of the country. This aspirational view of the organization, as well as the infrastructure that is required to be developed by 2030, allowed us to work backwards to determine how the department will achieve its true north. In the words of Peter Drucker, the best way to predict the future is to create it. A strategic planning committee was established comprising members from all of the divisions within the Department of Infrastructure, Ports and Transport to develop the strategic plan. This involved formulating the strategic direction of the department, which we see is you know, very well captured in, this, um, uh, in, the, in the unveiling of the, um, this, um, I guess, the, the different the values, the vision, and the mission. Uh, we also have the guiding principles as also a part of the strategic direction. And then the next step was to develop the strategic priorities and the respective action plans. And I must make this point, it's very important, it was really essential that a strategic plan be developed by the staff of the department so that they could effectively own the strategic plan. At this juncture, I really wish to highlight six major factors that influenced the development of Infrastructure 2030. There were many more. The first is the need to develop resilient infrastructure. And I think the Prime Minister, the theme of his presentation today was really to capture this particular uh, concept of developing resilient infrastructure and applying the principle of building back better in light of climate change and its attendant adverse impacts. Secondly, the department must embrace digitalization and offer all of its services to the public online. The digitalization of all services provided by the department will help to improve efficiency and provide greater convenience for citizens who do not have to queue up you know, in the office for its services. The third factor involves improving the capacity of the department to more effectively meet the needs of its stakeholders. There will be new skills required in some of the divisions, 
for the efficient execution of their mandates. Another area that needs special attention is the need to incorporate artificial intelligence in the operation of the department, as AI offers significant opportunities for improving the efficiency of its operations. Fourthly, the department needs to communicate more effectively with all of its stakeholders, and that process has begun. These include the citizens and other agencies that rely on the department for its services, as well as, of course, we cannot, we cannot forget the employees who work in the department. The fifth factor is the national thrust towards renewable energy and the need to transition from fossil fuels in keeping with St. Lucia's nationally determined contributions, commitments to, to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNFCCC as it is known. I'm happy to say that the Public Utilities and Energy Division of the Department is leading the charge towards transitioning to renewable energy. Finally, the Department has an ambitious infrastructure program which needs to be financed. There will be a need to examine innovative sources of financing as well as to seek funding from climate funds for adaptation and mitigation. In this regard, there is a need to collaborate closely with the departments of finance, economic development, and sustainable development. I would like to thank the Honorable Stevenson King, Senior Minister, who was always receptive to meeting with me to discuss the progress on Infrastructure 2030 and for sharing his insights and guidance. In meetings with him, he would say, I have booked no appointments, and therefore you have as much time as you need. I would also like to thank Ms. Lenisa Joseph, who was a real champion of Infrastructure 2030, and her successor, Ms. Lorraine Matthew, who continue, continued where she left off. We were able to meet every Monday morning to discuss progress and updates on the strategic plan, showing real commitment to this exercise. I would also like to thank the Strategic Planning Committee, who are the real architects of the strategic plan, and all of the stakeholders who shared their insights in terms in developing Infrastructure 2030. The real work has just begun, as the success of the strategic plan will be determined how well it is implemented. I am, however, confident that it will be implemented well, and the department will achieve its vision of being the flagship department critical to achieving infrastructural and national development. I thank you. Today, I'm elated at this juncture to address you in my capacity for infrastructure, for Minister for Infrastructure, Ports, Transport, physical development and urban renewal, with appendage responsibilities for energy, public utilities, and telecommunications. I'm doing so, in my opinion, at the cusp of the crossroads or the crossroads of St. Lucia's national infrastructure development journey, which calls for a critical national infrastructure strategic development plan if we are to be productive dynamic, and competitive in the global environment. The idea of Infrastructure 2030 was born out of years of my stewardship as Minister for Infrastructure, attempting to institutionalize a dynamism that would establish a new mindset, a new thinking, a new culture, a new attitude, a new ethos towards a sustainable fiscal future for St. Lucia. With that understanding and discipline, I am even more confident that the Commander-in-Chief, in the informal setting referred to as that five-star general, will adopt and commit to the ITF's policy guideline of linking strategic infrastructure plans to explicit infrastructure funding envelopes with project pipelines identified at least in broad terms. Once this strategy is adopted, 
and the citizenry understand our collective discipline and responsibility, we will be poised to compete in the global environment by the year 2030. In addition, there is also the need for our nation to become more efficient, more effective, and productive in ensuring that we obtain greater results with fewer resources. And I wish to repeat this. In addition, there is also the need for our nation to become more efficient, effective, and productive in ensuring that we can obtain greater results with fewer resources. Infrastructure 2030 focuses on optimizing our human and financial resources, cooperating and collaborating more effectively with our stakeholders to ensure that our economy can become more resilient through adaptation and mitigation, the risks that confront us all. Infrastructure 2030 provides strategic direction for all divisions within the Department of Infrastructure, Ports and Transport and ensures that a coherent, integrated and collaborative approach is taken in fulfilling the mission and meeting the vision to become the flagship department crit crit critical to achieving infrastructural and national development. In keeping with this ambitious and aspirational vision, Infrastructure 2030 seeks to achieve the following. Construct, repair, rehabilitate, and modernize our roads, bridges, and other public infrastructure with a particular focus on climate change, adaptation, resilience, equity, and safety for all inclusions. Two, strengthening the national transportation planning and regulatory framework to encourage sustainable transportation options, to improve access and equity to public transportation, and to reduce traffic congestion. Three, support the transition to net zero emissions by fostering the growth of renewable energy, primarily solar, wind, and geothermal, improving energy efficiency and encouraging investments in hybrid and electric vehicles. Four, transforming and modernizing the operations of the licensing department and the electrical services division to improve the efficiency of the applications and approvals process, but more so policy review. Transforming and modernizing the meteorological services division to strengthen its weather forecasting capacity to deal more effectively with the impacts of climate change. Six, creating a world-class organization with the talent and capacity to ensure that the department can implement its project, programs, and policies effectively and efficiently. And lastly, to institutionalize the maritime sector here in St. Lucia, we have a clearly defined organizational structure, independent of government and any other statutory organization, to uphold the international ideals and to meet all international conventions in managing and regulating the operations within our maritime boundaries. The road ahead of us will no doubt be full of roadblocks and obstacles. But I am confident that the collective ingenuity, resilience, and commitment of the staff of the department will enable us to navigate those challenges and achieve our strategic priorities and objectives. This will require us to be faithful to our values and guiding principles, to guide us in making the tough decisions that need to be made throughout the course of this journey. Infrastructure 2030 will no doubt provide the department with the anchor and framework to align our priorities with the SDGs, the NDCs, 
and our broader national development goals, strategies, and objectives to ensure that we improve the standard of living and quality of lives for all St. Lucians. I'm indeed looking forward with optimism, confidence, and excitement as the department forges ahead in implementing Infrastructure 2030 to provide a brighter future for all St. Lucians. Permit me this opportunity to close, but not without thanking the Permanent Secretary, Ms. Lenita Joseph, who upon her appointment as Deputy Permanent Secretary, embraced the idea of Infrastructure 2030 passionately and took flight with the initiative to propagate this positive message to staff and other agencies, including the general public. I must also thank the former Permanent Secretary, Mr. Ivor Daniel, in whose hands the initiative was first entrusted and who initiated the process of the appointment and the identification and the appointment of the consultant, Mr. Philip Dalsu, who established the strategic approach in this regard. Allow me also to acknowledge the work of Ms. Lauren Matthew, Deputy Permanent Secretary, for her invaluable contribution in continuing the relay of the baton from P.S. Joseph and administering the process of consultations to this point. I'm obliged to commend Chief Engineer Renata Filgen McKee, St. Lucia's first female Chief Engineer ever since the Works and Roads Act was promulgated in the year 1905. Renata, by nature, embraced the initiative and has been instrumental in sensitizing, energizing, and motivating her team with renewed confidence to embrace this bold and ambitious initiative, along with Mrs. Yasmin Reynolds Lambert, HRO, who has since, since her appointment infused the spirit of infrastructure among staff. Yesterday was a buzz of activity among staff here at infrastructure in this compound, on this compound, all engaged in setting up the landscape for today's landmark and historic event. Today's activity could not have been possible without the interest, energy, and enthusiasm of the entire infrastructure family around the island. I'm looking forward to even greater energy following today's launch. It is with this generated energy, commitment, and enthusiasm that I embrace and look forward to the full implementation of Infrastructure 2030 to give support to other agencies, to energize other units, and to make this initiative a full national initiative. Let us proceed to communicate clearly via explicit and detailed media this strategy of infrastructure 2030. I thank you.